Well, welcome everyone to this environmental justice network event, whistleblowing and environmental justice. We are delighted to be joined by three speakers today who will be talking about environmental related whistleblowing, a case study of environmental injustice in the UK and another international case study. They will be introduced properly by our chair in a minute, but before handing over to her, I just wanted to go through some housekeeping first. In autumn 2020, the IES conducted a survey to understand the experiences of environmental justice um, and how professionals in the environmental sector have been affected by issues related to this. Um, and particularly where science-based advice had been compromised or ignored in decision-making. In response to the survey findings, the Environmental Justice Network was set up. This network is designed to provide a safe space for environmental professionals to discuss and share their experiences of environmental justice and to hear from invited external speakers on topical issues, which is the focus of this event today. After all of the presentations, you will have the opportunity to ask questions, so please do submit these in the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen at any point during the presentation, and the chair will then read these out on your behalf later on. This webinar is being recorded, um, so you should be able to see most of the presentations um, on our YouTube channel later on. Thank you very much for logging in. I'm now going to hand over to Elizabeth Mulling-Smith, who will be chairing the session. Elizabeth is an IES council member and an EDI, EDNI champion on the council. She has played a leading role in developing the IES activities and environmental justice. In terms of her back, background, Elizabeth is an environmental management consultant with 30 years international experience on major infrastructure projects. Elizabeth, thanks so much for chairing today. I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Anthony, and welcome everyone. And um, thank you for joining us in your various quarters. I'd like to introduce uh, our first speaker, who is uh, Sybil Raphael. Sybil is Protect's legal director and an experienced employment solicitor. She is a leading whistleblower lawyer and worked alongside with both employers and whistleblowers. She has a wide, has a wide rating expertise in uh, helping organizations improve their whistleblowing arrangements and speak up culture. Protect is the UK's whistleblowing charity and is a leading authority in whistleblowing in the UK. Sybil, over to you. Hi everyone. So um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, employee activism and environmental um, whistleblowing. And why am I uh, best placed to do so? Well, because um, at Protect, we really have a 360 view of, of whistleblowing. At the heart of what we do is our free legal advice line. We advise whistleblowers or would-be whistleblowers want to raise a concern on the best way to do it, on how to escalate their concern if, if they've been uh, ignored, um, where to go, um, you know, whether you want to go to the regulator, whether you want to the media, uh, or, or how to escalate internally. Um, we are unusual in a charity in that we, we self-fund and we do so by selling training and consultancy on um, whistleblowing arrangements to organizations. So we also know how it works from the organizational uh, point of view. And we have, um, for instance, a, a whistleblowing audit, uh, which we call a benchmark, which really looks at all aspects of whistleblowing, governance, communication, operation, to see whether or not it works. And uh, from the start, we have a very strong policy and campaign arm. We were set up in 93 to campaign for the UK to adopt some kind of law to protect whistleblowers, which it did uh, in 98. Uh, so we're going to celebrate our 30th anniversary next week and the 25th anniversary of PEDA, the law protecting whistleblowers in the UK, uh, next uh, year. And we obviously still have a very strong policy and campaign arm. We have lots of ideas on how to make um, the law more effective. And indeed, uh, this morning, we were very pleased to see the government's response to a consultation on SLAP. Uh, SLAPS uh, is strategic litigation against public participation. It's a kind of lawsuit for defamation of breach of confidence that uh, organization launch against whistleblowers or uh, journalists who report on a public interest concern. Um, and uh, we're part of that sort of wider campaign on how can we make um, the law more effective to protect those who want to raise concerns uh, in the public interest. And uh, indeed, a lot of those concerns now uh, uh, are in relation to the environment. And um, it's interesting because we set up the advice line. Um, all we heard on, on the advice line was 
either financial misconduct or uh, pa patient safety. And since 2017, we've had a 100% increase in the proportion of harassment uh, and discrimination cases that, that we've heard. So Me Too, Black Lives Matters, what we call ethical concerns, uh, have really uh, risen to, to the fore. Um, the CMA, the Competition Market Authority in the UK, at the start of the year, suggested that over 40% of uh, greening, and another interesting figure, uh, in surveying the pool of 2,000 workers in August uh, 2020, it was found that 65% um, said they were more likely to work for business with a strong environmental uh, policy, and 83% uh, said uh, that their companies wasn't uh, doing enough. So consumers, employees, investors, and uh, society as a whole are increasingly asking how sustainable an organization is, how does it treat its people, is it being managed ethically and responsibly, how does it impact its communities, its environment, what is it doing to encourage uh, social justice uh, and uh, awareness, and, and more and more organizations are expected to put in place systems to um, help them meet these responsibilities and, and measure their impact. Um, they need to sort of demonstrate compliance and uh, uh, deliver results. But it's also been interesting is that we've seen the operation of a new stakeholder, the concerned citizen. So it's not just about investors, clients, or workers. You also have the concerned citizen, which sometimes uh, dust take action, as, as we will see, especially on, on environmental uh, matters. What you need to remember, though, is that the um, environmental regulation is a very fluid um, regulatory uh, 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 environment. It's quite a, a fluid um, landscape, so it's very, very much um, work in progress. When I thought about this session, I came up with these uh, questions, thinking, you know, what is it? Um, what are the actual legal obligation that organizations have on environmental issues. How can you, as an individual, blow the whistle on, on, on environmental concern? Uh, you know, what's the dividing line between uh, what we call um, editorial disagreement or you know, disagreement on green strategy and actual whistleblowing? What do you need to demonstrate to be protected by, uh, by the law? Because just saying you're not doing enough is probably not going to uh, get you the protection that you need, um, and, and how can you use, for instance, discrimination law um, in environmental uh, justice um, cases? And I want to say, uh, the more interactive the session, the better, so please, please don't hesitate to post any question you may have. Um, we've proposedly left uh, sometimes for, for questions uh, at the end, so um, uh, please don't hesitate. There, there are no silly questions, and they make uh, any talk far more interesting in, in, in my view. The first thing I want to, to talk about is actually the uh, definition of ESG, because environmental issues are part uh, of ESG, and ESG now is, is the sort of the new buzzword um, uh, that's flying around. Um, and, and, and the first point to note is that actually it is quite difficult to define. There's no set definition or unified agreement on um, what it actually is. Essentially, it's, it's a broad term that encapsulates a range of behavior, impacts, legislative requirements, or, or policies. And, and it does mean slightly different things to different uh, organizations. But the, the idea behind it is to, to look at the organization's social and environmental impact, trying to ensure the company follows the law and treats the humans and environment as well as possible. And, and what's interesting is that, is that where once directors had to act in the best interests of the company itself. And uh, now these duties are um, felt to be much broader and include the impact on the community and uh, on the environment. So ESG is not just about, about, about the environment, it's also about um, the S is for social, usually the G is for governance. So that's things like gender pay gap, modern slavery, um, ethical governance are also part of it, but obviously environment is absolutely key, and ESG is generally is key now more and more to investors, stakeholders, increasingly to uh, the clients, the customers, and, uh, and the suppliers. So th the first thing an organization has to do is to define their criteria. What is it that we are going to 
a measure. How do we internally uh, define our ESG? What is it that we want to demonstrate impact on? And that, that's the first um, that's the first bit. There, we, there are some law, actually, there's rather a lot of law uh, that relate to ESG. And I tried to um, give you this, this sort of timeline that shows that actually it's not that recent. You know, the Human Rights Act dates from uh, 1998. But even before that, good old common law, uh, tort and, and, and negligence um, do apply to uh, ESG matters and certainly to environmental matters. Uh, an organization uh, and, and individuals within an organization can owe a duty of care to uh, other individuals like, like customers or, or, or workers or indeed to um, the local uh, community and, and the breach uh, uh, of that duty that results in a loss uh, or, or in a damage uh, that was sufficiently foreseeable and not too removed from the breach itself can give rise to a claim and, and potentially to substantial um, damages. Obviously, the, the, the problem, and especially for environmental uh, issues, is how do you demonstrate that it was sufficiently foreseeable and how do you demonstrate it was not too removed and, and, um, and, and the causation is going to be very difficult because it's rare that you're going to be able to say this, you know, this particular uh, organization, uh, I don't know, um, uh, you know, polluting this particular river, uh, we can absolutely be sure that it was the entire fault of this particular organization. Um, most of the time, it's going to be um, an array of causes, uh, and uh, it's harder to sort of, you know, have a clear a finger pointing at, at, um, at someone in particular. But, but you still um, uh, have that. Some of uh, these laws are, are a bit less relevant to uh, environment, but I think it's worth you uh, still bearing in mind them. The one I want to highlight uh, is Section 1990 and 98 of the Financial Service and Markets Act of 2000. It provides a, a cause of action against companies for shareholders who suffer loss as a result of negligent misstatement in prospectus and fraudulent misstatement, misstatement in other published materials. This is quite important because greenwashing is a big thing. And as, um, as I'll explain uh, in, in a minute, actually, um, organizations, especially now in the financial sector, have a, an increasing number of, of um, obligations to report on green matters. And so um, uh, it's going to be much easier, especially for workers, who are the eyes and ears of an organization, to spot when, uh, when a company is, is basically greenwashing uh, and, and therefore potentially to be able to use that law to say, hey, it is a negligent misstatement. You know, you're saying we're a green investor fund or, or you're saying our pension fund only invests in green things or whatever. That's not right. And you have a direct cause uh, of action in this particular um, uh, statute. The other one that I wanted to tell you about is, um, is a section in the Companies Act of 2006. And that's the one that says that directors need to have regard to certain factors, such as the impact of the company's operation on the community and the environment when acting in good faith to promote the success of the company. It's quite um, a hard uh, action to, to action, basically, uh, but it's something that uh, is being increasingly used. Um, and, and there's one big case at the moment against uh, uh, Shell, which attracts a lot of um, publicity. We're going to talk about the Equality Act uh, when I explain how you can use discrimination law to protect yourself um, when you feel you're being um, treated unfavorably for, for raising an environmental uh, concern. There's also obviously the uh, Paris Agreement and in 2021, our, our, our new Environment uh, Act. The Shell case, I, I just wanted to uh, explain in a teensy more uh, details. So it's, um, you know, the, the, it's, it's a typical case of what we call um, share, shareholder uh, activism. Um, uh, and the interesting thing is that actually, because it's, uh, because it's not that easy to go against the um, individual directors, it's not really something that you necessarily hope to win when your uh, client has, for instance, which is the NGOs that uh, brought the action, but, but that's, you know, that, that's being done basically for publicity. 
Uh, and indeed, it's already had some effect because we, we, we've seen that it uh, certainly um, made Shell pause and, and reflect on, uh, uh, on the risk um, and, uh, and potentially review um, their strategy. So what was uh, sued Shell, Shell Board for failure to properly prepare the company uh, for net zero, and uh, um, uh, client has said that it puts them in breach of their legal duties, and it um, used the Paris Agreement as, uh, uh, as uh, you know, it claimed that that was part of their legal duties. And so that's, uh, 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 that includes a breach of the duties of the directors, uh, uh, a breach of section 171 that I was talking uh, a minute ago, which requires the directors to act in accordance with the company's constitution, and uh, to have regard uh, to uh, the environment. Uh, so it's not about uh, winning the case, uh, but it's very much about making some noise about it and, and, and increasing the sort of soft power. Um, that's the UK. Uh, abroad, you have things like duty of vigilance law in, in France. Uh, you're going, you know, it's not just basically in, in, in the UK that you have uh, that sort of thing. And, and you may also have heard about a, a, a claim against, um, uh, you know, using, especially in relation to human rights law, a claim against uh, Unilever, for instance, uh, uh, and, and the claims sort of, sort of claims that there's a thing that, yeah, you need to be aware of is that even if, if your company is not necessarily based in the UK, you can uh, bring a claim in the UK, um, and, and actually the UK courts, um, uh, you know, can hear or, or can hear the first stage of that sort of cases. Uh, and um, and again, in terms of soft power, even if you don't, uh, even if winning the case is going to be very hard, uh, at, at least from a publicity angle, it's uh, quite important. The other thing that I wanted to spend. At tiny bit of time on is uh, green uh, green reporting. Uh, I don't seem to be able to go to my next slide. <clears throat> I'm quite sure why. Oh, yeah. Okay, so green reporting and, and, and green um, financing. Um, it, from the 6th of April 2022, so that's quite new, um, uh, Thousands, yeah, we've calculated 1,300 of the largest UK registered companies will have to disclose certain climate related uh, financial uh, information. So it, it's not just about being encouraged to set climate targets, but now for the biggest organization, they're being required uh, to do so. And that's for the UK, but in the EU, we also have a directive which is being proposed and which uh, is to be implemented in 2026, that would introduce a duty of sustainable due diligence on both large EU companies and also non-EU companies with significant uh, EU activities. There's already a growing myriad of reporting duties for uh, um, organizations. And um, at the moment, it's, it's financial institutions and the larger companies which are the most impacted, but we're pretty sure uh, this is the direction of travel and uh, it, it, it's going to um, impact um, everyone uh, ultimately. Um, I, you know, I, I, I won't go into um, the detail of this, but, but there are uh, some very strict uh, disclosure uh, requirements. Uh, and it's something that the regulator, certainly in the financial sector, takes uh, uh, extremely uh, seriously. Um, and they've, you know, they've, they've issued a disclosure requirement uh, for listed securities. They've, they've issued new disclosure rules for asset managers and uh, life uh, insurers, uh, and they are going to um, take actions. Um, they, they're also um, very serious about uh, not allowing cover up and, and, and taking that sort of um, cover up culture. Um, rather seriously. I, I mentioned Tokyo Marine because it's very interesting for us at Protect in that it's a notice, so it's an, an action taken by the FCA uh, because uh, Tokyo Marine uh, w w was not good enough in investigating um, basically a whistleblowing uh, allegation and, and, and in fostering what the FCA said, uh, calls a sort of speak up culture. So it's it was very much 
addressing a lack of speak of culture within that uh, organization and the FCA saying, hey, even though it may not, uh, you know, at first sight, shout financial issues, something that the FCA as a finance regulator should, should, you know, should be concerned about. Actually, we are very concerned about this. We think it's absolutely crucial that the organizations we regulate ensure there's a healthy speak up and listen up culture. We think uh, cover up culture uh, shows something uh, really sinister and therefore we will take that um, very seriously. So it's not just um, uh, not reporting on your green uh, requirement. It's not just misleading the public making statements or whatever that, that the regulator is going to sanction. It's also just covering up, uh, not listening to uh, the whistleblower, not listening to whoever uh, raises a concern. Uh, it's also something that the regulator will take um, very seriously. So we've been talking about uh, green claim and uh, uh, green uh, washing. What is it really? Um, so greenwashing, it's the use of disingenuous environmental or eco-friendly uh, claims, for instance, natural, recyclable or organic, but by businesses to, to market products to consumers. It may be done by, by statements or emblems or logos or graphics uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and in the US, there's been several high profile uh, whistleblowing cases and, and, and gross in sort of shareholder activism and you may have heard um, the name of um, uh, Desiree Fixler, uh, who's a very high profile uh, ESG whistleblower. In the UK, there's a growing uh, social awareness of this, um, so though it's not yet on uh, the same scale. Uh, and it's something that the competition and market authorities uh, also takes very seriously. They've issued the green claims code, um, and, and they say that it's a key target uh, for um, them to help businesses understand and comply with their uh, existing um, obligation. Uh, and um, yeah, um, so um, one of the cases we've had in the UK concerned uh, smoothies, innocent uh, smoothies, for instance. There's an awful lot of um, uh, regulators that you know, could be uh, uh, relevant, and I've only listed a few. Um, on um, that slide. I need to go a little bit uh, quickly because I realize I, <laughs> time is, is, is running short. So how do you blow the whistle on, some, on, a, on an ESG uh, matter? Um, just, just so that everyone remembers, whistleblowing is about raising a concern about wrongdoing or a risk. It, it can be about just a suspicion that affects others that's the key thing that there must be something in the public interest with someone in authority, either internally and or uh, externally. And the actual definition of qualifying disclosure uh, as given by the law um, mentions explicitly uh, uh, the environment, um, you know, raising a concern that the environment has been or is likely uh, to be uh, damaged. Actually, there's not that many cases um, that relate to environmental um, uh, damage um, uh, there's one that um, we find very interesting on uh, against Bloomberg, a journalist called Mr. Carr, uh, who said that uh, Bloomberg was not doing enough in, um, in presenting environmental damage when they reported on uh, oil organization, uh, and he brought a claim, and, and he, um, I think he was dismissed, or, um, uh, for uh, performance, and he said, actually, the real reason I'm dismissed is because I brought concerns uh, about um, uh, Bloomberg's environmental um, uh, uh, yeah, um, stance, um, but he lost. And, and why did he lose? Uh, because, um, because the tribunal considered that actually it, it was more uh, uh, an editorial disagreement that actually, than, than, than an actual concern, than, than Mr. Bloomberg actually bringing some key information, either that the environment was uh, being damaged or that uh, Bloomberg was um, in breach of a, of a legal obligation. And, and in the next uh, slide, I tried to um, come up with some scenario as to, you know, what would a proper whistleblowing giving rise to you know, all the protection that the law gives be um, versus what would something be more like an editorial 
um, disagreement. And, um, you know, strategic disagreement is basically something vague. Oh, you're damaging the environment. You need, you need something more than a, a just an allegation. You need some kind of real information to sort of, um, uh, yeah, to sort of, to, to, for, for you to qualify uh, as a whistleblower. So it's the second uh, case here. You have some kind of information. So that, in our mind, would be more uh, like whistleblowing. The third case is a little bit more uh, difficult. It could be whistleblowing. It could just be strategic disagreement. It slightly depends on what exactly the bank says. Um, uh, you know, if they just said they made huge progress in their ESG standards without basically saying anything about um, decreased use of air travel, that may be, not be enough. It actually, uh, Jose has really crunched the numbers and, and you know, is able to prove that there is some kind of greenwashing here. Um, then potentially it may it, it may be enough, but it's a sort of a yeah uh, interesting thing to uh, keep in mind. What sort um, what sort uh, of uh, employment claim can you also um, agree? So you can bring a claim for a detrimental dismissal as a whistleblower under the Public um, Interest Disclosure Act. So for that you need to provide uh, information. You need to show that you raise that. In the public interest and you need to show that you raise it in accordance with the law that usually means you've, you're, you've gone internally it's quite easy also to be protected if you've, you've gone to the regulator it's harder to get protected if you go straight uh, to the media you could also use the equality act um, you could bring a claim for victimization because you feel you're being discriminated because of your belief in uh, that the environment is being damaged and that's something that um, has been the case since uh, 2010, the case of uh, Mr. Granger, <coughs> Mr. Nicholson against uh, Granger. He, he really believed that um, climate uh, was changing and uh, uh, that we were damaging the environment. It was not just an opinion, it was really um, uh, a belief that um, for life he was uh, vegan, he tried not to travel by air and so on and so forth, um, and, and the judges agreed that that kind of belief, when it really impacts your whole life, um, is something uh, that is worthy of being protected, and uh, therefore um, he could bring a claim uh, for uh, discrimination if indeed he felt he was being treated negatively because of this belief. So there's been another interesting uh, case uh, in the Employment Tribunal, uh, Mr. Kazamichna, um, uh, you know, raised concern that the League Against Cruel Sports pension fund was investing in things that actually were cruel to um, animals, uh, and he was dismissed. And he was able to say that to to, to show that he was dismissed uh, be, because of that. And, and here again, his veganism, the judge agrees that his veganism. Um, was akin to a kind of philosophical, almost religious belief, and therefore that he was protected. It's not going to be um, the case in every single time. And indeed, last month, we had another case of a vegan activist who rescued turkeys by uh, basically stealing them and hiding them under her bed and was dismissed uh, because of that. And here she lost because the uh, judge said that, you know, her belief um, uh, that sort of meant that she needed to break the law. <laughs> that's that's a limit because basically to be protected, belief can't um, you know needs to be worthy of, of respect in a democratic society. So it's unlikely that you're going to be protected if 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 you say well my belief um, um, you know leads me to to break the law. That's not something that the judge will take very uh, kindly to. So just remember that uh, you can use uh, the Equality Act. And the last thing just to mention, if you have a health and safety concern, there's also something in the Employment Rights Act that, gives, that um, says that if you're being um, dismissed or treated neg negatively because you raised uh, health and safety concerns, you, should, you, you, you will have a claim. Um, um, yeah, I've put on that slide the benefits of, of whistleblowing just in case that you are uh, doubting it, but uh, yeah, I want to leave time for questions. So, um, do we have any questions? And uh, if not, just please uh, unmute yourself or put them in the chat or in the Q and A. Um, I'd like nothing better than respond to some questions.
complete silence. <laughs> I hope I've not lost you completely. No, not at all. I'm just um, looking, just inviting individuals to either speak or write in the chat space. And we have a question. Um, does protect advice cover both UK and non-UK based issues? Um, yeah, that's a very important question. So we're, um, you know, I'm a UK solicitor. Uh, I know the UK law. Uh, so um, I'm not going to be able to advise you on Singaporean law if you're going to raise a concern and um, if your, your employment contract is, is uh, under Singaporean law and you work in Singapore. If you have a link to the UK, though, um, we may be able to help. And uh, certainly on how to raise your concern in the most effective way, how to escalate which regulator you can go to, uh, that's something that you know we potentially can can very much um, help. So don't hesitate to to contact us, even if you're not strictly speaking, um, uh, you know, working under UK employment contract, and, and and even if you're based in the UK. And and in relation to the environment, um, you know, you can raise a concern that's not being taken place in the UK. That's not problematic. If you're a UK worker, but you realise that your organisation damages the environment, I don't know, in Uganda. Um, if you're a, a UK worker, work in the UK, you can certainly raise your concern and be protected by the UK law. The fact that the concern is, is not happening in the UK is irrelevant. Uh, it's uh, what, what matters is the law that governs your employment contract. I hope that answers the question. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sybil. And um, just one last question. The um, new regulation that you spoke of, the uh, 2022 um, companies' um, climate-related financial disclosure. Do you yeah. see this extending to the charity sector, especially large charities? In the ah, that's a really good question. Uh, uh, actually, that's something we should um, talk about with the Charity Commission. Um, honest answer, I don't know. Uh, my uh, suspicion is that it will, ultimately. Uh, the Charity Commission, I mean, it's interesting, we, we have a lot of callers from the charity sector, partly because when you work in a charity, I think you strongly believe in the public interest, and therefore it really goes against the grain if, if you see something that's not quite right. So, you know, you, you tend to have maybe a higher portion of, of whistleblowers in the charity sector, I don't know. Certainly they make very good use of our of our advice line. Um, um, but yeah, I, I personally, I think so, but but um, but I'm, I'm not the Charity Commission. Uh, but that's something that actually I, I will bring to them because that, that will be uh, an interesting, um, yeah, uh, an interesting development. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Cyril. And um, thank you very much for exposing us to, to this aspect of um, the whistle on the whistleblowing, because in our sector, this is all new. So, um, you know, we needed some guidance and you certainly did that. And we, we really appreciate it. So thank you very much. No, my pleasure. And I mean, we have a website full of information, um, uh, you know, calling or emailing the advice line is entirely free. So please make use of it. Uh, we're, we're there uh, for you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sybil. So we will now move on to our second talk, which is our case study, um, and it's based in the UK. And it's Sheffield Street Ahead Project. And today we have Ian Robotham, who is the Emeritus Professor at the Advanced Wellbeing Research Centre at Sheffield Hallam University. And he's worked at the university for nearly 30 years and was formerly head of ecological services for Sheffield City Council. He's editor of the Agricultural Journal and also author and editor of numerous journals, papers, books, and popular articles. We're really pleased to have Ian here with us today to share with us about this particular case study, which is based in the UK. So Ian, over to you. Right, thank you for inviting me. Um, the presentation is fairly short. It's about 10 minutes on a very complex issue. Can I just ask, can you hear me okay? Loud and clear, thanks Ian. Yeah, okay, that's good, thank you. Um, having just heard what Sybil said and ha having heard the introduction, I just want to take a minute, if I may, to touch on some of the issues raised, because my role within this particular issue was at a number of different levels. One is that I am a local resident. One was that I worked 
for many years to set up and run an ecological advisory service for the city. But I also work with the local media and I do work with lots of community groups. Lots of my research work is citizen science work and I work with communities, um, in some cases, under threat from very aggressive planning applications. And some of the issues we just heard about are quite pertinent to dealing with those environmental challenges where a company or even a professional institute makes claims about environmental good and yet their members or the, the individual companies um, are paid a lot of money to actually end up causing environmental harm. And this did come into the issue with the Sheffield Street Trees, which was basically a public-private partnership between a cash-strapped city council and a big multinational company. And at times, because of my very roles, I had to steer a very careful line in this ethically because I edit the main national and international journal in the field. So I didn't want to be, appear to be abusing my position, but I have quite a high profile. And at various points, people, professionals within the client, the, the client company, Amy, were actually contacting me off record to confirm things that I was suggesting about um, malpractice and financial irregularity and all sorts of things. And I had to be very, very careful because people were told within the company that if they spoke to me, they would lose their jobs. So there were all sorts of ethical issues which actually came up um, in this situation. So a bit of background and context. Sheffield is the greenest city we claim in Western Europe, industrial city. Over 80 ancient woodlands and famously green treed suburbs. But we also have some underlying issues linked to our um, industrial past in that there are major health divides across the northeast southwest belt. And for example, the uh, adult male life expectancy drops about 10 years in something about one to two kilometers distance, which is absolutely appalling. Now, part of that is to do with lifestyle. Part of it is due to social and economic uh, deprivation, but some of it is due to differences in environmental quality. And what this project did, the £2.4 billion project over about 25 years, and it seriously comprom compromised environmental quality, particularly in the less affluent areas where the street trees were hugely important. So some background, problems with managing urban street trees, their economics and politics go back many, many decades. It's not a new phenomenon, but this was affected uh, by the idea of public-private partnership, which was seen as a way of actually eking out cash strapped local authorities. Of course, the money has to be paid back. So the city now has a major debt to be serviced. Uh, recent events have triggered much wider uh, much greater awareness by the public, by professionals and politicians. But we've been aware that street trees can be a controversial issue for a long, long time. And you can see here a typical example. This is not a big tree. It's an ornamental cherry, probably planted in the 1950s. And it's the wrong tree in the wrong place. It's a variety that should not be planted in this situation. It has massive roots that burrow through tarmac, concrete walls and whatever gets in the way. So wrong tree, wrong place, and what we now advocate is the right tree in the right place. Back in 2010, we had a national meeting in London, the UK Man and the Biosphere Conference on street trees. And at that, I noted that we once again face drastic cuts in public services. This is following the meltdown, and especially in local authority provision. And I suggest that this will leave street trees especially vulnerable since they have no voice and they cannot speak. At least they can't speak to most of us. And with the politics of street trees, this is a potentially very bad scenario. I, I didn't expect that this would actually come home to roost in my own backyard. I raised issues of accountability, of ownership, of responsibility, and of local environmental democracy. And at that meeting, I was acutely aware that there were there's a polarization of about 50-50 between tree professionals, some of whose approach was the street trees are ours, they are our responsibility, we do what we do, it's our decision, no one else has a say. And then the other half 
were people that work with the community saying these are the community's property. We work with the community. We want the community to help determine their environmental future. So this was a deep schism already present. We then fast forward to 2013. Things started to get very bad very quickly in Sheffield. But I must say that the experiences in Sheffield were not unique. Many cities uh, across the UK were affected. And I was being approached by community groups and professionals um, in Birmingham, in Southampton, in Newcastle, in York, in Leeds, in Bradford, and elsewhere, all with similar tales to tell. In Sheffield, what became the core celeb was the public response and the campaign to save their trees, to show that people cared about trees. And it seemed to myself and a colleague at Sheffield University, a very eminent political scientist, uh, Matthew Flinders, that the issues and protests became a lightning rod for wider discontent, particularly to do with local environmental democracy and the way that we manage or fail to manage effectively urban green spaces. So this became a, a, a bigger issue. But the big problem for me at first was the whole thing about environmental democracy. Whose trees are they? My attitude when I worked for the local authority was that we were there as public servants and the countryside, the green space, the trees, the woodlands were being managed by us on behalf of the community. And they were owned by the community. The city council was merely the agency for that. Not everybody agreed. We then have issues about things like engagement, education, training, involvement, participation, empowerment, responsibility, quality of life, heritage, biodiversity, and also necessary networking and funding to support community champions, who in Sheffield emerged from literally from the woodwork to support community projects. These people came out, they were not from a, a specialist background, but they became experts in their own right in dealing with street trees and urban environmental issues and urban democracy. And they were the ones who then drove the campaign over the next nearly 10 years. And there were particularly crass little uh, bits of events. This was happening across the whole city in different neighborhoods, but Western Road was a particularly sad occur um, occurrence when street trees that were planted for war heroes had fallen um, in World War I were about to be completely felled along this particular road. These have been planted by pupils of the former school in memory, commemoration of the fallen in the Great War. And the felling was going to happen of these perfectly healthy, not uh, dead, dying or dangerous trees. They're just a bit inconvenient. This was going to happen on the anniversary of the song. You couldn't get much more poignant. We felt at the end of the whole thing that there, no, there were no winners for all this. So we, a tipping point was to save our rustlings trees, the rustlings road trees to the west of Sheffield. This was by no means the worst situation. It was by no means the community most at need, but it was a community who were very professional, very vociferous and very anti the tree felling. Um, and they were not people to tangle with. And they came out in droves to challenge the city council and Amy's um, draconian approach. There were all sorts of issues raised. One of the reasons for removing the street trees, we were told, was that they were discriminatory. They affected access of the less able. And this is a tree on Rustings Road, which the locals are desperate to, to save. And in actual fact, what happened was we asked the local party, have you had any, you know, how many complaints have you had from people with mobility issues or access issues? And they reluctantly admitted they'd never had any issues raised at all, ever. Um, and then what happened when they cut some of the trees down, was that a local partially sighted man who navigated previously by the trees on the road uh, walked smack into a lamp stand that had been placed in the middle of the pavement. So there were all sorts of issues. And this, I have to say, this isn't a picture in Sheffield. I think this is London, but it gives some idea of what happened next because the campaign was starting to dwindle, uh, media interest was, was lapsing, and then the city council at Amy had an early morning raid on people's homes at Rustling's Road, 
because people hadn't moved their cars in order to allow vehicle access to do the, the tree removal. Um, and people were woken at three and four o'clock in the morning and people were arrested, including two elderly retired ladies, uh, one of whom was a retired professor from Sheffield University. At this point, and with social media being what it was, interest skyrocketed, the campaign just picked up dramatically and it became a global environmental event. What seemed to happen, trying to step back from the um, emotive issues, was you had a local authority who were being pushed into opportunistic short-term ill-judged approaches. They were uninformed and these approaches were unneeded. And they were being bounced into this to fix long-term problems of the street trees that have been neglected and shortfalls in their own budget and reductions in staff, particularly of skilled staff. There was a lot of long-term vision strategies and commitments. And I was in a fortunate position of having read, uh, written quite a lot of these back in the past. So I was aware of what commitments there were to the people of Sheffield, to the community, by the City Council, democratically established and agreed, which were now just simply being uh, pigeonholed and ignored. There was a lack of proper process, so no environmental impact assessments, no assessments of landscape sensitivity or heritage trees, etc. There was lack of consultation. Consultation was reduced to notification. Uh, lots of effective environmental democracy as a result. They were also really worrying, and this is still being investigated by an ongoing inquiry in Sheffield into the street tree catastrophe, was that there were campaigns of deliberate misinformation and even lies by city council and its officers, including to statutory bodies. And some of these raised quite serious legal um, and ethical issues. At the start of the campaign, around about 2013, I was being contacted by local groups and individuals through my role with the Sheffield Star newspaper and BBC Radio Sheffield. And that was expressing uh, serious disquiet and concern about street trees and ancient woods across the city. There were bad things happening that had never happened before, certainly not for 30 or 40 years, and people were very concerned. So I approached Amy, the contractor, and I approached City Council to say, can we have a discussion? Can we resolve these things? Because I think it's going to get quite difficult. And I was told in no uncertain terms, there is no problem. We don't need advice. Please go away. Um, what we then did with the Green Party, the Liberal Democrats and some local Labour group members were, and Sheffield Wildlife Trust and others was to organise public meetings to discuss the issues and bring together the disparate separated community groups from across the city so they could share experiences under one umbrella. And also because of my role within the profession nationally, I was able to bring into public meetings uh, national experts on best practice and um, arboricultural practice nationally and internationally. So we brought in some big hitters to actually help and to advise. Jack Scott, who was a councillor, because one of the issues that happened was that the council moved to a, uh, a cabinet system with an individual councillor having full responsibility for a particular area of influence. And councillor Jack Scott was the one in charge of street trees and the streets, the Streets Ahead programme. And his comment when we approached him was nobody cares about street trees and most people would like to get rid of them. So we then followed that up with local groups and with the media and said, do you realise what people are saying? One of the issues was that we identified quite early doors was that there'd been a, a loss of key skills because you have a local authority under financial cost from central government for a long time and then actually lost the key people, the good local authority officers who would communicate and would inform and work with local community, etc. They would also work within the, lo the local authority communicating to members and to other officers. And that didn't happen. And the result, this is a massive campaign that went absolutely global, where we had megastars from TV, from the media, uh, local community people. This was a, a double-decker bus which you could go up and kids could go and see the white letter hair street butterflies laying their eggs on one of the threatened elm trees of Sheffield. Disease resistant, but not Amy resistant. Um, and we had local musicians and all sorts of other people and poets all coming to Sheffield, all contributing, a mass rallies of 500 to 1,000 people on the town hall steps and city hall steps. This was a typical road. This is Mearsbrook Park Road, um, Edwardian or Victorian plantings. And 
the result was going to be the complete removal of all these trees. What's happened now because of the campaign ultimately is the road was safely resurfaced. Most of the trees have been safeguarded, but there were some very, very acrimonious uh, aspects to this. At the end of nearly 10 years of absolute grief and pain and a huge amount of uh, unneeded expenditure, over you know, millions of pounds of city council money spent on legal fees. And to some extent, the street tree situation has been in part resolved. There's still an ongoing inquiry, but there are now better communications and the strategy. There are emerging current threats still to ancient woodland. Some of these are dictated by, for example, DEFRA, who identify areas of disease, particularly in large, and then through the Forest Commission, notify landowners, city council perhaps, or the wildlife trust perhaps, at their own expense to clear fell large areas of ancient woodland without any prior survey, without any consultation, without any discussion, and at their own expense. This is just absolutely appalling. So the problem is not going to weigh its kind of more. The outcome of nearly 10 years of troubles has been a degree of resolution, as I say, and there are lessons to be learned and applied more widely. This is not just a local Sheffield thing. There were changes in local democracy, which have meant that going from a committee, which I know from experience is quite bureaucratic, to a cabinet process. That has been reversed by uh, people voting at local elections. There are issues of transparency through that change to cabinet process and of accountability. Individuals were not subject to scrutiny. This is compounded by privatization, which happens with the public-private partnership, because when you get privatization, you lose access to information which you previously had. It becomes commercially sensitive, and therefore even councillors couldn't find out about budgets that they were spending on their assets. And this was an unforeseeable consequence of the public-private partnership. And these issues resonate nationally and internationally in terms of impacts. Just to finish with some key lessons, there are issues about process and communication, about skills and knowledge and commitment, about champions. If City Council, Sheffield City Council, had not got rid of their senior countryside planning officers, there would have been people sufficiently senior within the local authority to challenge this contract before it was signed. And they would have said to the leader of the council, you cannot sign this. I know that City Council's three officers did say that, they did red pen the contract, their comments were ignored, they were not sufficiently senior or protected to actually take it any further. But I do know from private consultation that that's what happened. But a senior consent officer would have challenged this, it would not have gone ahead, it's cost millions of pounds. There was not due diligence in contract by either the private partner in the public-private partnership or by City Council. They were both out, you know, out of their depth. It was just crazy. They were not aware of existing commitments. They were not told about existing commitments and contracts with the community of Sheffield. There are lessons about the value of highways trees, about the value of highways tree officers in particular, and the cost of failure to do it right. And there are issues about long-term and short-term um, economically driven actions and a lack of awareness and knowledge from the highest level to the lowest. People making decisions on this just did not understand the importance of street trees, particularly in a climate change scenario and in an issue, a situation of health and well-being, etc. Some final thoughts on social and political issues. £2.4 billion pounds of public-private partnership for highways and street trees. Disadvantaged groups, communities and areas were disproportionately affected by what happened. The stress and the health and well-being issues were catastrophic for many of the communities affected, but by those disadvantaged groups in the poorer areas disproportionately. And there is still unrest between and within communities, and this was deliberately fostered by the City Council to try and set neighbour against neighbour. Some people were pro the trees, some people were anti, and there is deep-seated antagonism and abuse, and this is still not really being resolved or in fact looked at in detail. The final comment is that overall, if you want good quality, efficient public services and a high quality, sustainable environment, and I think we all subscribe to that sentiment, then unfortunately you have to pay the price. And most politicians don't want to hear that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, very 
very thought provoking. And um, thank you very much for being thorough in going through the, um, the journey. Um, because many of us probably saw the sound bites, but not understand what went on behind, uh, behind that. Um, I'd like to invite individuals who have questions for Ian to post them um, in the Q&A section. And we will take all the questions at the, the end of the presentation of the case studies. Thank you very much. I'd like to introduce my uh, second uh, presenter. And this is Janine Compton-Antoine. And she's going to talk about a, a, a particular case in St. Lucia. And Janine is a marine biologist by training and has worked in many conservation and resource management um, projects over her last 30 years. And Mrs. Antoine, uh, Compton Antoine, is considered to be a regional expert in cetaceans. And in 2012, she was elected as the first and only female chairperson for the International Whaling Commission, the IWC, to date, and in the 75 years of that organization's existence. Mrs. Compton Antoine is, has also served as an elected parliamentary representative in St. Lucia for the constituency of Miku North in East uh, St. Lucia. She continues to work with various community groups in Mikuno and around the island of St. Lucia to assist in the holistic development of St. Lucia and was appointed as director of the St. Lucia National Trust, a not-for-profit uh, non-government organization in 2021. Um, Janine, I'll just hand over to you right away and thank you very much for joining us. Hi, good morning, everyone. Well, it's good afternoon, um, UK. It's still, it's still morning in, in St. Lucia. So I would very much like to firstly thank um, IES for the invitation and for reaching out to the National Trust through my colleague, Finola Jennings-Clark. And I'm excited to be here to present um, about one of our case studies, but to show as well the challenges that we have in small island states um, because of the limited resources that we have. So um, as Elizabeth rightly said, I am from St. Lucia. We are a small Caribbean island with a population of about 180,000 people. So, you know, very small population, but, um, you know, we're very charismatic people and, and we, we are making a, our mark in, in the world. Um, St. Lucia's main economy or main um, drivers in our economy are agriculture and tourism. Um, in the past, up until 1997, the main um, economic drivers were agriculture, but we moved um, further into tourism and now tourism makes up 65% of our gross domestic product. So the governments tend to push in for tourism development, which leaves the island um, vulnerable to um, unplanned and unregulated development because a lot of the developers come with, with plans that they think um, are good selling points, but at the end of the day, it, it tends to disadvantage the, um, the population and also the environment. So the case study I'm going to be talking about today is the Kaba development, which is in the the north of St. Lucia, uh, and, and it is a, a very large development um, taking up hundreds of acres of land, and it has a myriad of different problems. One of the challenges that we have, and I mean, I was interested to hear um, what Sybil was saying this morning in, in that we don't fully know how to access justice in terms of how do we get to um, companies in the UK to make them more accountable? Or how do we make companies, for example, um, Cabot is a Canadian company. So how do we you know, have them be more accountable utilizing the legislative means in the countries like Canada? So again, one of the things that, sends, I mean, the National Trust promotes is that we promote sustainable development. So we're not anti-tourism and we're not anti-hotel development because obviously for a small country like that, 
you have to provide for for jobs you have to provide for um you know economic generators because especially during covid it, it showed us clearly that um if we don't have um diversification in terms of our products we will be you know severely impacted and so I shall move into my presentation and just give a little bit of background um, as I go through. So this is um, the area where that we're talking about. And as you can clearly see, there are green areas and brown areas. So this happened after the hotel started developing. And basically what they did, they, they're building a golf course together with a lot of condominiums and, and other, other parts of the hotel development. But what they did is they clear cut um, all the vegetation in certain areas. And if you look here in this area, here close to the beach and close to the sea, you will see that there's no vegetation. So this, um, especially now during the rainy season, you're having high levels of runoff into the marine environment. So killing the coral reefs and the seagrass beds, which are instrumental and unnecessary for fisheries and, and other um, activities within the island. And the area that is, is highlighted is all proposed golf course area, but what they haven't taken into consideration is the level of runoff going on into the sea, the nutrients that would be coming off um, from the golf course again into the into the sea, and also the impacts that is going to have to the the overall environment. So this area here that is is shown is another part of the the development, and one of the areas in within that development is a is a. Amerindian um, historical site and what they plan for the historical site, which includes a burial ground is restaurants and swimming pools on top of the burial grounds. So it was offensive to St. Lucians. It was offensive to um, you know, the, the National Trust as a heritage organization. So what we did is together with other organizations and agencies, including the Archaeological and Historical Society, lobby for this area to be protected, to ensure that our history is maintained and also to allow, for, for example, that the hotel developers can use, use that area to, you know, as a site that their visitors can also patronize. So, it can be done in a way to marry both the hotel developments or development and the natural environment and your historical sites. But what tends to happen is that the developers come in and they just want to take over everything and not take into consideration the local considerations. And this is what is happening with, with the Kaba development. So, so what they then started to do was to to clear all of this area here, again, as, and as I said, this, this area uh, where you see the small peninsula is uh, a burial ground for um, the Kalinago people. And even though this area was designated within the environmental impact assessment, which is something that has to be done for, um, development through the, our development control authority, it is mandatory. They breached the, this pink area here is a breach of the archeological and historical priority area. So again, disregard for the laws and regulations of St. Lucia. The problem that we have is that um, we have weak, um, institutional regulatory um, frameworks that allow some of them to be able to bypass some of the rules and regulations of St. Lucia. And as well, sometimes you have um, weak politicians, even though I was in politics before, um, I, I went into it specifically to advocate for the environment. And so you have politicians who are easily coerced 
or would bend over to allow the developer to get away with um, infractions against our regulations and rules. So in this case here, they were in breach of these infractions. And then even though we reached out to the government to have the matter dealt with, it wasn't dealt with because the government's sole focus was ensuring that the development happened regardless of the environmental considerations. And so th this area here is a proposal for the, the golf tees. And what they tend to do is put the, the holes in very strange locations, very close. I mean, I suppose for them, for, for, I'm not a golfer. So for persons who are golfing to have those holes in areas of difficulty, but there again, it, it creates environmental hazards because you have clear cutting very close to the sea. There are no buffer zones there and, and there's an increase in runoff into these areas. And these beaches along here are important turtle nesting sites. And they're also important spawning grounds for, for particular um, marine species. And this is an example of the peninsula. So I will just, let me see if I can go back. So this is the peninsula here. The, the, and if you go forward, if I go forward, this is what they did to the peninsula. So basically without approval from the government, they went ahead and they built this, this area here. And as you can see, there's no vegetation. This is going right off into the sea and again, run off. So again, disregard for the rules and regulations of, of um, St. Lucia and also the environmental considerations. And I mean, it's disappointing when you see a hotel development doing that because at the end of the day, they should be protecting their environment environment because it enhances the product that they're trying to sell. So again, this is another view of the area where they've clear cut everything. They've extended again with very loose soil that there has a propensity to run off quickly into the ocean environment. Now, this is another example. This is not the Kama development, but based on our experiences, we, this is another development that happened in the southeast of St. Lucia in another area with similar to Cabot with historical sites and coral reefs, seagrass beds and, and, and major environmental hotspots for endangered species. And so this was a private land that was sold to a developer. And even though they were told, you know, there were specific restrictions, especially because there were bird species that are endangered and, and one of them is endemic only found in St. Lucia, they disregarded again, those considerations. And the image to your right shows here what happened with the development. So they clear cut the forests, they, which again is an important nesting site for that endangered species and to create these golf courses. What happened with this development is they went bankrupt they, during the financial crisis. And this area now has been left abandoned since the, the early 2000s. So again, if they had taken into consideration the environmental recommendations made by the various agencies, including the Department of Fisheries and Department of Forestry, they would not have had that level of impact. But again, not looking at the regulations and ensuring the regulations are enforced. So this, this here is a, a clear case of what happens when you have an uncouth developer and weak um, political directorates and also weak legislation. So these developments tend to have, even though they are um, put forward as 
being able to provide employment opportunities to the general populace. They also impact the general populace by not taking into consideration the existing livelihoods and, and uses of the area. Because prior to the developer coming in, this isn't a, a, a situation where it is a, an area that is not utilized. This area is heavily utilized by solutions for recreational and also for alternative livelihoods. So one of the things that you may have seen in the news around the, um, the world is that within the Caribbean region, we are having an issue with sargassum, which is something that we haven't had in the past. And what the hotel developer was proposing, so in the past, well, presently, solutions use tend to use this area towards the top and near the peninsula for recreation. The sea currents are now pushing all this sargassum debris down here. And so the intention of the developer is to utilize the upper area for themselves and to push solutions down into this unsavory area where you have sargassum, which um, does exude toxic gas at times, and you also have the accumulation of plastics that have been washed into the sea or uh, within the environment accumulating in this area. So again, the developer not factoring in the, the traditional uses of the solutions, but looking only at their aspect and not how they could marry the solutions utilizing that together with their patrons. Because one of the things that we've noticed over the years is that there's a growing animosity in St. Lucia towards that kind of development because it ostracizes the general population. So this is an example of the, the sargassum that washes up on the beach. So as you can see towards the top, there is not much, but towards the bottom, this seaweed is accumulating and it, it is, makes it you know, not suitable for bathing. And so this is an example of the Kazabar area. And as you can see, this is the location we tend to use. And this is the location towards the south that they would like solutions to use, but it is not suitable for, for um, bathing. And this is another example of the sargassum accumulating in that area. As you can see, mounds and mounds of seaweed intermixed with um, marine um, debris, plastics that come from other locations, including um, other islands. So this area is used for alternative livelihoods. So as you can see, there's a gentleman fishing here. And there's another person fishing here. It's also used for horse riding, very, very popular um, site for horse riding and also for um, hiking. And it's also a very popular site for kite surfing. And so kite surfing can only happen in specific locations within San Lucia and this one is, a, is an area that it, it can happen. So again, alternative livelihoods that are being implemented by San Lucia. So one of the things the National Trust and, and other organizations had been lobbying for is that the, the Queen's Chain, which is a, a, a specific 200 feet from the, the shoreline that allows um, for the use by the general public to be maintained and preserved for solutions. What tends to happen is that the developers request a lease of the Queen's Chain. And when they lease the Queen's Chain, which, which goes from the high water mark um, 200 um, feet in, it, it, it's, they are able to block solutions of, from accessing the coastline, accessing these resources, and again, marginalizing the general public. Again, another area of recreation um, close to the beach where you know, solutions and visitors alike enjoy um, you know, just, just being there. This is a, is a very, uh, very well-known local um, bar. So this is, this is the Cabot area here in this location. 
So this is the north of St. Lucia. And this is the area where I was talking about, which is the Queen's Chain. And so this area is heavily utilized by the public for hiking and tours, just general recreation, fishing, um, and all the other activities that I, I, I showed earlier. But as you can see, this is the development. And the intention is to develop right up along the Queen's Chain. And so again, blocking off the access to, to solutions. And what they said is that in order for us to access the property, they would have to, we would have to go onto their property and get into golf carts and they would escort us to specific locations. But again, marginalizing the general public. So what we've been advocating for and advocating to the government is that leaving that buffer zone of the Queen's Chain for the general public that allows a use for both by patrons of the hotel and St. Lucians alike to enjoy that, that space. And I'll just quickly go through. So, so again, this is another area where this is a very, very, very popular beach, um, Donkey Beach. And if you look here, they're looking to put in this golf course. Now in St. Lucia, um, beaches are public. All beaches are public um, and right of access must be maintained. But if you look, they are basically trying to create a situation where there will be no right of access because they have condos on the peninsula here and a golf course here. So again, marginalizing and pushing St. Lucians aside. And this is the same beach that I was talking about. And again, this is the, the hotel development. And I mean, it shows us the sprawling expanse that they want to come right up to the, to the, the, the shoreline. I mean, as well, it is, it's not wise for them to do that in terms of development, because I mean, we are, we are an island that sits in the hurricane belt. So, and this is on the east coast of the island. So you do get storm surges and you do get um, flooding events. So again, if, if they looked at the overall impact to them as well, they would recognize that there's a need to push back and to be further away from the coastline. As well, they, they should be looking at the overall impact to the water resources because an area of this size with all these condos and villas and golf courses put a, a tremendous strain on the water resources of the island. And this, the, the, the northern part of the island tends to be very, very dry. And so that there are issues with accessing portable water. They've been talking about doing desalination, but again, desalination comes with its cons because desalination then as part of the process, you're exuding brine into the environment, which would kill off the marine um, life in those areas. And as I mentioned, um, there is an archaeological site. This is uh, an archaeological dig that um, we had in the early 2000s by Leiden University. And this is a recent dig that we had um, during the, as part of the um, EIA phase when the, the developer was looking to develop here we went back in and we undertook a dig in 2021 and we were able to find a lot more artifacts. So even though a number of universities have already come in to the site, they, and we've removed the majority of skeletons that have been found there, we're still finding artifacts. So we've been lobbying for the government to protect this area and establish it as a place of memory and a place of learning. Uh, the, the government changed in 2020, 20, 21. And the, the new administration has been working together with us and they have agreed to designate this area as a protected area for the prosperity. And to, so, so that solutions will know 
the historical sites, the history, and also visitors as well will also know that. But for, for me, it is not that, you know, when you have someone who has a passion that comes into government, that you're able to get things done. The legislation should be strengthened and external companies should also be taken to account using the, the international legislation to ensure that they do not breach those um, environmental impacts that they're having do, to, to ensure that the, the impact on the country is, is minimized. And this is one of the um, skeletons of a Kalinago that were found at the site. And this is some of the um, artifacts that we found in the 2021 dig. So these are all different artifacts that we we found in 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 the dig. Um, this one is is a, a a tool made out of a a conch shell. Uh, this is a sandpaper. Um, they would have used coral to um, as a an abrading tool because they didn't have sandpaper in in the past, of course. So again, showing how you can utilize your environment and the resources around you to create those things. So they would have used that for sanding tools, um, boats, arrows, all of those sort of things. And so the, the, the Ansler Wood area is a very, very important area. And as you said, we've been advocating for that area to be kept as a place of memory, but not also, not only as a place of memory, a place of, of learning so that persons will know of the inhabitants that came before. There are also fossils in the area. So this is a, a fossilized shell. They're unique um, vegetation. Some of them are only found in this area. And I mean, this poor guy, um, sadly, he, he, he didn't make it, but this is a turnip gecko. So again, unique flora and fauna found in the area. So one of the things that, I mean, we've been pushing for is the need for dialogue. We're not saying that, you know, we're adverse to development, but there needs to be dialogue and there needs to be clear guidelines as to how to marry sustainable development with that development, how to marry the environment, how to work to ensure that the environment is protected and we get the best out of it. Right now, what is happening is that we are clear cutting. And I mean, Cabot is, the, is one area. And I showed you another one, which was La Paradis, and there are other areas around St. Lucia and within the region as well that are being impacted by this. And what then will happen is after the developers have done and reaped all their benefits and the country is left to carry the environmental burden, they'll pack up and leave. And so again, the, 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 there is a need to ensure sustainable development in, in St. Lucia. And this, this, is, um, this is another location. This actually is in another island. This is Kanawan in the Grenadines. And this entire Northern section was actually sold off to um, a developer, an Italian developer. And so the people of Kanawan don't have access. They only have access if they're working at the hotel. Um, they don't have access to the, the, the places that, you know, they, they used to recreate and they used to enjoy. And, you know, it, it has created a level of anger and frustration. There's an uh, underlying frustration in, in, in Kanawan. So even though it provided employment for, for that community of people, they were pushed aside and marginalized. And I, we don't want to see the same thing happening in St. Lucia. So there's the, the National Trust, the Archaeological Society, and other, other groups will continue to advocate to ensure that this doesn't happen in, in St. Lucia. And as I mentioned, we've seen this slide already. So that's it for me. Um, if anyone has any questions, as I said, one of the things that the Trust would like to know is how we can work together with IES and others 
to understand the le legislative framework, the international legislative framework as to how we can keep um, developers accountable and to ensure that they focus, they do take the environment to um, have an interest in the environment and ensure that this, our environment is protected for future generations. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Janine. And we really appreciate you sharing the, the realities of the developer interface with um, the cultural and uh, space and space, space and place, and the sensitivities associated with that. Um, that often we, we have that visibility. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to take us through that journey. And um, we, we do have a few questions. And um, I would like to move quickly to that. And uh, I think, Laurent, you wanted to um, ask the question verbally. So I'm inviting you to, to do so, Laurent. So if you unmute. Can I speak now? Are you hearing me? Uh, yes, Laurent. Thank you yes, very much. Yes, greetings and salutations. Janine, good job. Um, I have um, a sort of a, an addendum to an extension to Janine's co um, contribution, one that deals with recreation in, 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 in a very sensitive place on the island in the south, under a world heritage site in the, in the southern, south, southwestern part of the area, where developers have come in and cordoned off the access to the beach, which is supposed to be a public place for recreation, especially people who are disabled for the general public, but disabled people or people who want to come for a sea bath to recreate, they have just, they've cordoned off the area where you cannot even bring your, your old aunts or grandmothers or grandfathers or people who are disabled or sick into the beach to recreate. And I think that's, that's, we need help in how we can, whistleblowers could put that in the public domain, the international domain, to name and shame these developers who are coming into St. Lucia. And some of them own the land and they're just cutting off all the, the natural uses or the, the traditional uses of, the, of that space. So how do we develop that kind of advocacy in the international arena, in the international arena, so that we will be able to make an impact so that they will cease and desist from such activities. It has been happening for too long on a number of beaches on St. Lucia, including the one Janine has just articulated so beautifully upon and in depth, uh, but places like Jalousie and in the same general area. And that's a very important space for, it's a world heritage site. And in essence, there and it's an understudied heritage, heritage side as much as as well. Much more needs to be done. So we want to know how do we develop that that alliance, that 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 connection with the, with the, the international whistleblowers of the environment in order to flag these cases, so we would have a voice in the international arena. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Lauren. And I would like to possibly um, share that uh, response or to between Janine and Sybil. As Lawrence asking about um, a particular issue in St. Lucia, but he's also trying to raise the profile uh, um, on this particular issue um, from a, an island state to international where developers come in and um, override the um, sociocultural um, use of space and place. So uh, Janine or Sibyl, would you like to respond? If you just raise your hand, I'll know which one would like to respond. Janine, thanks very much. I'll pass over to Sibyl because um, we are also asking the same, same questions uh, from the National Trust perspective, because one of the challenges that we had was trying to um get you know advocacy out there internationally so we did go to the media international media houses and and i suppose our story wasn't you know exciting enough and i suppose there are other things 
happening in the world. But I mean, one of the things that we would like to know is how how do you um, get in to the advocacy groups? Because we, we don't know many of them um, in St. Lucia. We hear about them um, in passing. And so I think it's important for us to, to build the networks. I do know about the issue that Laura is talking about, but you know, to, to strengthen our network so that we can also pass on the information to other colleagues in other islands as well, so that they are aware of how to deal with those challenges. Thank you very much, Janine. Um, it looks like Ian has answered that one. So this one was to do with, is there a risk for a repeat of the experience in Sheffield elsewhere or than our measures under PPP to prevent this happening again? Um, and Ian replied saying, a major inquiry is ongoing and will produce recommendations a short-term output was the government's appointment of a national tree campaign and need to have an EIA for large tree felling work. Wonderful, thank you very much. Thank you for the question. And Ian, thank you very much for responding to that. And uh, Laurent, do you still have a question? What's Sandy? No, I, I was waiting for the good lady to give us some guidance or even Ian himself, how we can get in the international arena to voice our concern because i think that's what developers or so-called developers i call them developers that's what they do if there's no international pressure and they embed with the government of the day therefore they are empowered to do that but if we could get the pressure going on internationally um we have a voice in the international arena to name and shame them and bring it to light, we think we have a greater impact there because it will, it will affect their bottom line. So when they want to sell condos and so forth, people would be very careful how they put their monies into these activities or this enterprise. So it's a case of getting into the international space. That's what they had. The local domain is they, 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 they bring in sort of um, well, of course, let's be clear, they have bribes and money and, and they get into local communities and, you know, they, you know, we have a phrase in St. Lucia, we say, even if you're hungry, you shouldn't drink poison, but they, they bring whatever they want to people and they, they bluff them, put t-shirts for, for, for sports clubs and pay that they're on, um, what you call um, community-based projects, you know, small, small gifts here and there, and I usually say, beware of Greeks bearing gifts. And so we have that tension that, that we need international support. We need to go international in these cases. If we don't, we lose in the battle. We are really losing the battle. In other words, they don't give a, a, a hoot because the government's on their side. And it depends on which government as well. You know, but all governments here seem to be, you know, say you cannot bite the hands that feed you kind of thing. And so we have a serious, serious tension. And, and the community is left out, the popular um, 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 sentiment is left out. We are losing our access to our beaches. And that's a major place of recreation. Even by law, we're supposed to have that access and development should not take place on the beaches. It's happening. We've, it's happening and we're just powerless to stop it. So we need your help in the international arena as much as we can to make a voice for the community voice, the local people, not just the governments, not just the government level, but the, the actual users of the property. We are being kept out of our patrimony, which is our, our right to enjoy the land of our birth. Thank you so much, Laurent. Uh, we have Sybil. Um, ready to to answer your question so uh Sybil over to you yes sorry um um yeah Laura, it's quite um, you know I've, I've set up if you can find a um a link to the UK potentially you can bring a, a, a claim and um you know they will claim claims go to um uh, against Unilever and against uh, Shell that were started in the UK. So um, these are difficult claims and it's unlikely you're going to win them. But in terms of making noise and, and soft power, it, you know, it, it, it might be a solution. It, it's a very expensive endeavor. Um, legal costs in the UK are huge. Um, 
pretty sure you know that. So um, uh, it, it's not, you know, it's not something that I would recommend you start without having the resources to do so and without you know, thinking about it carefully. Uh, but there are some claims that you can bring, um, and even if you're not going to uh, win them, uh, you may uh, achieve what you want by 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 bringing them basically. So, um, but, but you you'll probably need clever solicitors to help you on those. That's my slightly disappointing answer. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you, Sibyl. And do you have um, any advice in in terms of connecting with comparable um, organisations in Canada? Um, no, but we are very good friends with Win uh, Whistleblower International Network. I'll put the the website on uh, the chat. And it might be worth contacting them because they, they will uh, probably know better than I do of, of similar uh, whistleblowing organization in, in Canada. Let me put the details on the, um, on the chat. Wonderful. Thank you, Sybil. Um, Lauren, please look for the, um, the link which Sybil will be will. posting yeah. in, in the chat. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. The journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, and that's a little step in in the in the process thank you you're most welcome well thank you all for joining us in this um wonderful uh, event or, or webinar series and we would like to hear from you and you know to give us feedback on um, this event and also your your thoughts on future events future themes and um we do post on, on our website. This is the um, Institution um, of Environment Sciences, uh, other webinars in our series. And um, I would like to take this moment to hand over to my colleague, Ethne, who will um, just run up, close up this, this session, but also to point you to the relevant links. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Elizabeth. Um, in the interest of time, I know we've gone slightly over here. Um, so thank you so much for everyone logging in today and a massive thank you to all of our speakers, uh, Janine, Ian, Sybil, um, and to our chair, Elizabeth. It's been really great having you. Um, thanks for sticking with us. Um, as I've put in the chat, please do send any ideas for future topics or events through to me. My email address is in there. Um, we really want these um, these events to be member led, so we'd really, re uh, really appreciate any thoughts that you have. Please do send them through to me. Um, so, yes, I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you so much for joining today. Um, and um, any of the presentations, some of the presentations will be will be shared um, after after this event. Thank you very much.